Tell me when to start. Right now. Welcome to the Board of Education Candidate Forum. I am Susan Albertine, President of the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to our co-sponsors, leading with the Montgomery County Council of Parent Teacher Associations and the following. NAACP Montgomery County, Identity Inc., American Association of University Women, Metro DCP Flag, OCA DC, Asian Pacific American Advocates, Alpha Kappa Alpha, Theta Omega Omega Chapter, Delta Sigma Theta, Potomac Valley Alumni Chapter, Chinese American Parent Association of Montgomery County, AA Move, Asian Americans Mobilize, Organize, Vote and Empower, and Montgomery College, MC Votes. Our co-sponsors have provided the questions we will ask the candidates tonight. Tonight, we also have live interpretation in Spanish and Amharic. To choose Spanish or Amharic, select the interpretation button in the meeting controls located at the bottom of the Zoom window. You will hear the translated audio as well as the original audio at a lower volume. If you don't want to hear the original, you can mute it in the same location. You may also select the CC button for closed caption, then choose settings, then select the language you prefer, such as Chinese. We hope that this event helps you as a voter to make your selections for the consequential Board of Education. And now I present Debbie Orsak, President of the Council of PTAs. Thank you, Susan, and welcome everyone. I am Debbie Orsak, the president of MCCPTA, the Montgomery County Council of PTAs. We are so pleased to once again be working with the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County to bring you this important event to help all of you learn a little bit more about the candidates for the Board of Education so that you can be informed and vote for the best candidates to help you advocate for all our children. I want to remind everyone of the guidelines for this virtual forum. This is a Zoom webinar which means that all viewers can see the participants but will not be seen themselves, nor will viewers be able to communicate with the candidates or hosts. We have disabled the chat and Q&A buttons. We are recording the event for later viewing on YouTube. Now, to get us started, I am pleased to introduce our moderator, Tanya Bowie, who is the co-founder of AA Move, Asian Americans Mobilize, Organize, Vote and Empower. Tanya focuses on increasing the political and civic engagement of Asian American communities at the local, state, and federal levels. She is also a former blogger for Montgomery Community Media, and her blog, Politics Within Politics, is aimed at building the pipeline for women of color in politics. Thank you for being with us tonight, Tanya. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. Good evening, everyone. We are so excited to host tonight's Board of Education Candidate Forum. And as Debbie had mentioned, this event is going to give you a great idea of who the candidates are and how their experiences and interests influence their responses tonight. There are three school board races in contention this year, at large, District 2, and District 4. The candidates who have joined us tonight are, at, for at large, we have Lynn Harris, Sharif Hidayat, Melissa Kim, Rita Montoya, and Fitzgerald Mofor. Running in District 2 are Brenda Diaz, Ricky Moy, Rebecca Smandrowski, Abby Choi, and Natalie Zimmerman. For District 4, we have Shebra Evans, Bethany Mandel, and Laura Stewart. Thank you all for joining us. 
Now, all of these candidates must live in their districts and all county voters may vote for their preferred candidates in each of these districts and the at-large race. So tonight, we'll group the candidates by district so you can see those who are competing against each other. And because of the large number of candidates tonight, we will be using a time clock. And that will appear in a window to count down the time left for each candidate to speak. They must stop at the end of their time so everyone is given an equal chance to respond. We will begin with one minute opening statements. Then we will move on to our questions submitted by the co-sponsoring organizations of this event. To keep us moving along, we'll group the candidates by district or at large and ask them to respond to a particular question. Each candidate has only 30 seconds to respond to the question. Candidates won't be speaking in the same order for each question. And finally, we will go ahead and close by having each of the candidates provide a closing statement for one minute. Um, just for a housekeeping reminder, we kindly ask each candidate to speak slowly and clearly at a slower pace for our Spanish and Amharic interpreters. And as a friendly reminder, tonight's Zoom webinar includes a closed captioning function in more than 20 language, languages. So go ahead and click on that CC button at the bottom of your screen, select settings and under auto translate, select one of the languages that appear. All right, are we all ready to begin? Okay. So we are going to start with our opening statements. The timer clock will start when I call on you. We will start with the at-large candidates and I welcome Ms. Harris. Good evening, everyone. So glad to see you all here. I so deeply appreciate the work of the League of Women Voters, MCCPTA, and all the sponsoring organizations to help voters do their homework before they go to the polls. Um, my name is Lynn Harris. My pronouns are she, her. I've had the honor of serving on the board since December of 2020. And as I look back on my service, the reason I ran in 2020 remains my motivation. I believe very deeply that we must create a school system in which every single person, every single day, feels safe, welcome, and valued, being exactly who they are, and that we create a series of affirming and inclusive classrooms in which windows and mirrors rule the day. So students see themselves reflected in the in the content they're taught, in the books they read, and they also gain a much deeper understanding of the lives and experiences of those whose lives are different from theirs. Um, I look forward to hearing the questions this evening, and thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Mr. Hadayat. Thank you, and thank you for the League of Women Voters for hosting this event. My name is Sharif Hadayat. I have uh, two kids that attend Montgomery County Public Schools. I'm uh, a retired Montgomery County police officer where I served for over 20 years as the community service officer for the Wheaton District, which is the District 4. Um, in that capacity, I had to solve a lot of quality of life issues and uh, chronic problems in the community. And so I had to always think outside the box by um, collaborating with nonprofit organizations, other agencies, civic associations, homeowners associations. So the skills uh, that I bring to the Board of Education is I'm a collaborator, I'm a great listener, and it's all with the goal of improving our community. Um, I also had experience with working with, and this is where the uh, association with the school system is, I worked hand in hand with our school resource officers, with our truancy prevention program through the state's attorney's office because we all collectively believe that we should mentor these kids to try to keep them in school so we don't have to deal with them later on in life with problems. Thank um, you, Mr. Hadayat. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to call on Ms. Kim. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Kim. I never thought I would be running for an elective office, but I'm running because I'm increasingly uh, frustrated with our school experiences. Of course, we were all impacted by COVID-19, but in particular, our kids lost a ton socially and academically. Um, and I just don't believe that we've done enough to get back to a stronger place with high standards in our schools, as well as a place where our schools are full of joy. Um, just as a quick uh, example, when my oldest was in fifth grade, he just wrote one three paragraph essay for the entire year. And that was a county standard for fifth grade writing. That just is, that standard is far, far too low. Um, I've been a teacher, a middle school principal, chief academic officer, as well as deputy superintendent. And I'm also a mom of two kids in CPS. I'm really excited to bring both my personal experience as a mom, as well as professional experiences to strengthen the supports of our school system so that every student can thrive. 
Thank you so much. I'd like to call on Ms. Montoya. Good evening and thank you all for being here. My name is Rita Montoya. I'm a mom of two elementary school kids, a PTA president and a former juvenile public defender. If elected, I'll work hard to rebuild trust in MCPS, provide culturally competent, clear and timely information to MCPS families and work with MCPS to provide students with tailored programs serving all student needs and learning styles. MCPS's biggest problem right now is a lack of community trust. This lack of trust negatively impacts budget allocations, hiring and retention of staff, class enrollment, and family engagement. This also hurts our students' ability to advance, achieve, and succeed. If elected, I'll model accountability, leadership, oversight, and transparency to rebuild trust in MCPS by students, families, educators, staff, community members, and elected officials. I'll work to establish open lines of communication to ensure a collaborative approach to improving MCPS. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call Mr. Mopar. Greetings. My name is Fitzgerald Mofor. I attended MTPS for my formative years of education and ultimately began my career as an educator in private and public schools. Subsequently, I matriculated in electoral politics while earning my master's in law. In the recent years, I worked in the Maryland State Senate and as an advocate for asylum seekers. My political crusade for a robust educational access for historically marginalized students began once I understood that education is a palpable lever that can proliferate socioeconomic upward mobility. MSDE math scores and truancy percentages indicate a lack of substantive progress in addressing the achievement gap. Montgomery Village Middle School has a 95% minority rate and only 5% of the students are competent in math. These poignant statistics can be reversed with the implementation of CTE expansion, wage parity for paraeducators, and extended learning opportunities. Thank you guys so much for your time and consideration. Thank you so much. Now we are going to move on to the District 2 candidates. I'd like to start off with Ms. Diaz. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm really excited to uh, speak about my platform and who I am. So my name is Brenda M. Diaz. I am running principally because of my experience, uh, 20 plus years in education. I've served from a member of the PTA, cultural chair, to an administrator, to an elementary school teacher, former softball coach, name it, I've done it in education. I even have a farm and forest program right now. So I'm motivated to be the independent voice for parents, students, and teachers in MCPS. Um, I'm, I'm motivated to rebuild the foundation of academic excellence. I want to prioritize safety. I want to boost teacher morale because I believe that's linked to academic performance. I want to ensure responsible resource allocation through diligent oversight of our budget. And I want to respect and encourage parental involvement within MCPS. I look forward to telling you more about me this evening. Thank you. Mr. Moy. Good evening. Ni hao. And buenas tardes, Montgomery County voters. My name is Ricky Moy. I'm a proud parent, a Navy veteran, and a professional problem solver. I need your help to enable me to steer us back on course to develop quality education and knowledge, our society's most valuable possession. Each year, the public school system, uh, budget gets larger. We pay more taxes, yet our teachers, bus drivers, building maintenance, and student programs struggle to meet to make ends meet. The path is clear to me. Support and respect our frontline educators, engage our parents, and develop our students' minds, bodies, and spirit to be the future of Montgomery County. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call on Ms. Smandrowski. Don't know if Ms. Smandrowski is able to get back on. Well, we'll come back to her um, with it for the District 2 candidates. I'd like to call on Ms. Choi. Uh, good evening. 
My name is Abby Cherry. I'm a Rockville mom who's a mother of five. And all my kids have been part of uh, Montgomery County for some time of their life. They, they have been part of Montgomery County Public School. And uh, I would like to be run for the MCPS school uh, board with the ultimate goal of providing our students with a world class education and helping them fulfill their greatest potential. I will ensure that MCPS is run accordingly to universal standard of professionalism, ethics, accountability, transparency, and good governance. Thank you so much. Thank you. I see uh, Ms. Mandrowski has raised her hand. If you are able to join us and come back and do your opening statement. All right, um, I'll give her a moment again. So I'd like to call on Ms. Zimmerman. Good evening, um, I'm really excited to be here and thank you so much for having me. My name is Natalie Zimmerman and I am running for Board of Education District 2. My biggest reason for running for this position has to do with my personal classroom experience. Right now I'm an educator at Wheaton Woods Elementary School. Um, I teach second grade. So yes, I'm a current MCPS teacher. And um, if you haven't spent your day with seven-year-olds before, I suggested it's a pure joy. Um, I believe that investing in public education is the greatest act of optimism that we can do as a community. And I believe that it is the greatest investment that we can give to our children. This is their future and it is the of the utmost importance. Um, if I'm elected to the board, I will utilize my skills as an educator and my knowledge of the reality of the day-to-day -day in MCPS in our classrooms to make sure that we are making decisions that benefit all of our students, all of our educators, all of our administrators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. I, looking at the chat here, I think Ms. Mandrowski is able to join us. So Ms. Mandrowski, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry about all of that. I do want to thank everyone for sponsoring this tonight. My name is Rebecca Smondrowski. I'm a resident of the city of Gaithersburg, a mom of two MCPS students, and an independent voice representing um, District 2 on the Board of Education. Um, you know, I've dedicated myself to ensuring, doing everything I can to ensure that every child has a positive school experience. And that means more than just getting A's and B's. It means different things to different children. Um, it's about feeling valued, engaged, safe, um, and connected with their schools. Uh, it means having the guidance and encouragement to reach their fullest potentials and the opportunities and access in order to do, um, you know, make their pathways that are needed to get where they want to go with their futures. Um, I'm sorry, I'm very flustered because of the whole phone thing not working. Um, but anyways, uh, I just I would love to have your support. I've been I have historical um, knowledge that I think is important. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to District Four candidates. I'd like to welcome Ms. Evans. Sure. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shebra Evans, and I first want to thank the League of Women Voters and the other sponsors for allowing this discussion to happen this evening. I am a resident of Montgomery County, living in District 4 for the past 23 years, and um, it brings me extreme joy to be able to run for school board again. I have two daughters, and that one has been a uh, in the system, she's a graduate and another who is currently in the system. I have used the lens of being a parent and a board member to help inform me as I do this work. And my commitment remains the same. I've been on the board for seven and a half years and I'm still committed to equity and excellence. This is a very good system that is looking at um, our internal accountability and to ensure that our students are meeting the measures to be successful. We have an equity accountability model that we're being very transparent in trying to make certain that we're unmasking the disparities that exist for our black and brown students. So I would love to um, continue to do this work and I look forward to the discussion that's ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call on Ms. Mandel. Hey, I don't see her quite yet and we'll welcome her when she arrives. Um, Ms. Stewart. Hello, my name is Laura Stewart and I'm running for the Board of Education District 4. I've been a Montgomery County resident for 27 years and my two children are recent MCPS graduates. 
At my core, I am a mom who deeply cares about kids. Growing up, I learned about Takum Alum, which teaches that it is my responsibility to make the world a more just place. For over a decade, I brought that work to leadership positions in six different nonprofit boards, including executive positions for both Montgomery and the state PTA. I am a relationship builder who will work hard to ensure our kids get a world-class education. I have done more than talk. I've jumped into action, even by getting legislation passed. I have the experience to bring accountability, collaboration, and transparency back to the Board of Education, which is the oversight body for MCPS. And I hope to earn your vote. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And that was our opening statement of the program. We are now going to move to our Q&A portion of the forum. As I, we had mentioned that these questions were submitted by the sponsors of our event tonight. Our first question will start off with the at-large candidates. The question is, teen mental health crisis, that's the topic. What programs and policies would you propose or support to help address the ongoing concerns around student mental health? Again, this will start with at-large candidates and I will call on Mr. Mofor. Yes, so as a member of the Board of Education to address the mental health issues that we have, uh, I would like to proliferate proven policy ideals, so to speak, that work, specifically physical education. Physical education can be utilized to give students uh, an outlet, essentially. And we also need to expand on our capital budget improvement plans on wellness centers, too, as well. I know we have a couple in Damascus and Burnsville, but I would like to see expanded and strong fidelity there. Thank you so much. Ms. Matoya. Kids need motivation. They need motivation to get up. They need motivation to go to school. They need motivation to invest in themselves. And so in the context of the school system, I think that we need to make sure that we're providing a wealth of opportunities so that every single student can find some reason that they want to go to school that day. The reality is that most kids aren't loving to go to school because they love math, but they love theater. They love their sports team. They love the science club, they love ballroom dancing, right? We need to make sure that we have all of these opportunities for kids so that they want to be in our schools and they can feel better about themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kim. Um, <clears throat> students need to feel like they belong in our school system and that they matter. They need to feel known by other teachers as well as adults and students. And the lack of connected abilities in our schools is what's keeping our students uh, more isolated. Our children are dealing with a slew of competing um, things like have them connected via online, but those things are also keeping them very separated. So we as educators do think about the developmental ages and stages of students in middle and high school that is very different from younger children and make sure that we're creating programs to get them engaged. I generally think that they need to be at the center of all experiences. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Mr. Hidayat. Yes, thank you. I genuinely believe that a lot of the mental health issues are stemming from the continuation from COVID in the sense that this, during COVID, kids were isolated and they ended up using technology such as their cell phones to feel connected. If elected, what I think is what the biggest problem is, is this phone, oop, this phone. If elected, I plan on uh, ensuring that during academic instruction, cell phones will be limited during the course of instruction. I think that that's one of the biggest barriers is that and the drug use that's going on in the school system. Thank you. Now, Ms. Harris. Um, I believe strongly no decisions about them without them. And so to deal with the mental health crisis among youth, which is of long standing, but definitely exacerbated by uh, predatory algorithms in, you know, in cell phone in the 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 programs that students use on their social media, but also um, by the isolation of the pandemic. So continuing the supports we brought in schools, but also making sure every student is getting an ed education in which they see value. Thank you so much. We will move on to District 2 candidates. The question again is on the teen, teen mental health crisis. 
what programs and policies would you propose or support to help address the ongoing concerns around student mental health? I'd like to call on Mr. Moy. Thank you. This is a wonderful question and uh, something I've actually had a chance to deal with uh, in my nonprofit world. So there's a great group called AA Success in Virginia. Uh, they also help students throughout the DMV. The most important thing is to listen, right? We have to understand what the dip, what the mental challenge is. Not everyone's the same. You, there's no cookie cutter program that's going to be able to help. What we can do is listen, provide the 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 support via nonprofit group, groups, or have teachers engage and continue to speak. Bring Thank the you, parents Mr. in. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Thank you. Ms. Zimmerman. Um, first, I believe part of this problem has to do with MCPS not meeting our nationally recommended ratios for school counselors, school psychologists, and school social workers. Not only are we understaffed, but our staffing ratios aren't meant to meet what's nationally recommended. Um, a huge factor here as well is that students need to feel emotionally safe and supported. And part of that is having a physical presence of staff in the building that they can connect with and create those relationships. I believe that another policy that could help would be offering excuse mental health days for students. I believe that we can also increase our peer-to-peer -peer support groups that are then supported by educators as well. Thank you. Ms. Choi. <clears throat> okay. So for the question of mental health, it's something that is affecting more and more students in whole uh, Montgomery County Public School. One of the effects to one of the problem that that uh, causing more mental health is because of uh, students are still suffering from the uh, post COVID era and everything that was related to uh, isolation. So that's why they're using more of their cell phone. That's why they more in social media, and that's why they're having a lot of problem um um right now mentally. So if elected, we will try to do more counseling in the school system, and also. Also, we will also try to to uh, bring more uh, psychologists in the school to help. Thank you, students. thank you, Ms. Choi. Now, Ms. Mandraski. Sorry about that. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, kids need to feel connected and valued in school, and we can provide the best solutions when we listen to them. Um, in my role as the chair of the policy management committee, um, I've advocated for county policies to support our students and mental health issues um, in every way possible. Um, everything from looking at what uh, supports victims need to mental health days uh, as part of our discussion for um, excused absences. Thank you. So. Ms. Diaz. Yes, thank you. I think the biggest problem that we're facing right now is that our students understand or understood from the message the Board of Education sent was that school is not important and we need to reverse that. One of the ways that we can address the mental health crisis is by increasing rigor back into the classroom. When students know that they're being challenged, they want to meet that challenge. Um, also, we need to make encourage them and let them know that when they perform their best, we are here for them. That's how we address the teen mental health crisis. Thank you. Now I'd like to call on our District 4 candidates. We'll start with Ms. Stewart. Well, first, um, I support that we uh, build connections back to kids. And some of that will be, has to be intentional. So direct outreach programs for extracurricular activities, clubs, and maybe have more lunch bunches so kids can connect with each other. We also need to expand our mental health services in school, providing more access to telehealth appointments. Um, there was a law that just passed in Annapolis. Um, it still needs to be signed by the governor, but that would expand some of those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Evans. Sure, thank you for that question. So as a current board member, I support in every budget, school um, psychologists, social workers, and counselors, and COVID-19 exacerbated the mental health crisis for our students. 
Just this past weekend, I was in North New Orleans for the National School Board Association Conference, where our um, social workers won the Magna Award. They won the Magna Award for the social work that they've been doing. Um, over 4,600 students have accessed support from social workers this past school year, and then um, 1,700 are still um, trying to receive services from social workers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Ms. Mandel, welcome. There we go. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Bethany Mandel. I uh, had some technical issues. I'm a mom of six and live in Montgomery County. I am a writer and an activist uh, for education. I wrote a best-selling book, uh, came out a year ago called Stolen Youth. And a lot of why I'm running is because of the issues that I talked about in that book. And I'm a little confused hearing from the folks who are in charge of the school district for the last three years, four years, that the issue is COVID-19. No, the issue is not COVID-19. It was our district's response to COVID-19. It told students that school is unessential and that they are unimportant. They were put last. And Thank it's you. time for people in our school district, starting with our school Thank board, you, put families and students first. Thank you, Ms. Mandel. We're going to move on to the next question. Question two is the opportunity gap. What specific initiatives do you propose to support all students, especially black and brown students, to help close achievement gaps and have equitable access to resources, advanced courses, and effective teachers and administrators? We are going to call on District 2 candidates first for this question. We will start with Ms. Mandrosky. Sorry. 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 Sorry about that. Um, we were having some technical difficulties. Um, so as far as uh, closing, working on closing the achievement gaps, the best way to serve our students is to know our students. We need to be using data, up-to-date data and resources that are um, equitably Dist distributed across the county for the kids who need them the most. Um, we need to be making sure that we're targeting support systems and, um, and really evaluating on a regular basis the needs of our children as our county it continues to change. Thank you. Mr. Moy. Thank you. So setting goals, policies, and resources. That's what the count, uh, Board of Education does. So policy... I would make sure we have correct CTEs, career and technical education uh, facilities dispersed throughout the county so you don't have to travel very far. Uh, resources, make sure that I met some students recently that spoke Spanish uh, predominantly. Make sure that they have uh, ability to, to uh, catch up in English if they desire. We need to fund these programs. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Diaz. Yeah, so as a former MCPS social studies teacher at Gatesburg, Maryland, uh, Gatesburg High School, I worked with many ESOL students. And one of the ways that I helped to address the achievement gap was by uh, working closely with my para. I prioritized my time uh, for lesson planning and such. So one of the things that I would do is look, work with teachers in particular to boost teacher morale, partner with paras, ensure that our schools are fully staffed and fully equipped. I would pr promote smaller classes and make sure that teachers have abundant time for planning uh, their lessons. Thank you. I'd like to call on Ms. Zimmerman. I believe one way that I would like to address the achievement gap has to do with us implementing high quality implicit bias training. Um, our goal is not here to just check a box, but actually create connection and therefore create change. We know that our black and brown students are less likely to be recommended for challenging courses than their white and Asian peers, not because of their lack of ability, but because of implicit bias. Beyond that, we need to be looking at our policies for recruitment and retention of our educators at schools that teach our most vulnerable students. One way we can do this is with mentorship programs for both students and staff. Thank you. Ms. Choi. Hi. 
Uh, for this question, I was thinking that we have to make uh, more material, more school material that uh, available to all students and also uh, emphasize on tutoring, so helping the students uh, that are falling be behind in school, talking uh, to them, uh, uh, boosting them. And so it's all, uh, everybody's working here to help all the students achieve and to be a great performer in school. Well, for all of them is possible because I'm a color, color mom and I, I have students that have been achieving in my house. Thank so you. I know it's possible. Thank you, Ms. Choi. Moving on to District 4 candidates, I'll read the question again. This is on the opportunity gap. What specific initiatives do you propose to support all students, especially black and brown students, to help close achievement gaps and have equitable access to resources, advanced courses, and effective teachers and administrators. I'd call on Ms. Mendel. Thank you so much. The question is, is really how can we help all Montgomery County students, not just black and brown students, every student. And at the end of the day, we need to shift our focus from extreme race-based obsession to just increasing merit and, and telling students that school is important and they are valued and that they need to come every day. Our attendance is absolutely bucketed through the course of the pandemic and afterwards because students were told the school was inessential. They need to have motivation to show up every single day and understand that this is the pathway to a, a prosperous future. Thank and that's you. not a message Thank you, Ms. Right Mendel. Now. Thank you. I'd like to call on Ms. Stewart. Yes, um, first of all, we need to make sure we're expanding universal pre-K. It needs to be funded um, at, by the state as well. Uh, we need scholarships offered to train the teachers. Um, we have literacy gaps and right now our math performance gap is extremely high. So we need to work out um, the curriculum, have an early warning system and intervention teams and we can close the tutoring gap by partnering with our nonprofits. Thank you. Ms. Evans? Yes, so as a current serving board member, I am all about access and opportunity and have supported since 2017, the expansion of pre-K. Um, so we've had more than, we have hundreds of students that have been able to access school day pre-K. It looks like more students um, being in AP and IB. We are now currently paying for AP and IB exams. And the opportunity schools, that is allowing more students to be able to be able to um, take part in AP exams. And universal screening, we want to make sure that parents don't have to know about programs, that we are looking across the board in our school system and who is able to access accelerated learning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I call on the large candidates, Mr. Hadayat. Well, what I find amazing about the question is, is that no school board member currently has actually achieved this, uh, closing the achievement gap, but they have all the solutions currently. Um, here's the thing. You're never going to solve the achievement gap until you ensure that kids attend school. You, you, you enforce the attendance policy. You promote the TPP program, the truancy prevention program, and you have role models such as the school resource officers in the schools. I think when kids feel safe, and they're free from a, a drug-free zone, a drug-free school, uh, th then they're going to achieve and you're going to close that achievement gap because we saw those results. Thank you. Ms. Kim. Um, so I just don't think there's one practice or policy that needs to be ch shifted or changed uh, to close achievement gap. The achievement gap, I believe, is a mirror of our society's broader inequities. And part of what we need to be willing to do is recreate our systems um, and practices so that it does not continue to do what it's currently doing. In a, a former life, <clears throat> we took the opportunity to have deep, deep community engagement with students directly, as well as their families and communities to really examine what that school experience should be. Thank and we you. redesigned schools. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Mr. Mofar? Yes, to close the achievement gap, we have to expand pre-K to attack the achievement gap on the onset of early childhood education. Secondly, we have to offer wage parity for paraeducators to shrink the size of classrooms and offer individualized learning mechanisms. 
we also need extended learning too as well. And we need to provide more funding and contractual services to get more literacy coaches and math tutors. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Montoya? Thank you. As a Head Start graduate, I know that expanding pre-K is so important, but I also know that it's not enough. MCPS needs to meet the needs of students in need of support, as well as those in need of enrichment. If elected, I'll work hard to expand school initiatives like WIN, the What I Need program, which is being piloted, groups similarly situated students together for 30 minutes, four times a week with a different teacher to work on concepts where they might need support or receive enrichment in subjects where they excel, and early results are already looking promising. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Harris. Lots of great ideas shared. I um, am a firm believer that we need to completely rethink the way we provide opportunities and programs in the system and that every single great opportunity MCPS provides needs to be truly geographically accessible to every student. That means making sure every great program like VAPA at Einstein and CAP at Blair and Global Ecology at Poolsville is available at at least five locations around the county so that no matter where you live, you can get there without having to get on a bus for an hour or more. And um, it's not a barrier. Thank you. We are now going to move on to question three, and that's on student safety. How should the Board of Education ensure the safety of all of our students? What is your position on having police in schools? We'll start with District 4, Ms. Evans. Thank you for the question. So um, today we had our board meeting talking just about that. And for me, I um, so currently we have CEOs, community engagement officers. And what I believe needs to happen is that the community engagement officers need to interact with the principals and the security team currently at the school, le learning our student code of conduct, being trauma informed, being culturally responsible and, and making certain that they're building relationships so our families and students know and, and can feel safe in the school. Thank you. Ms. Stewart? Yes, I do believe we need to coordinate more with our CEOs to make sure that they're um, in communication with school administration and we can be proactive on some of the safety issues that have come up. Um, we also should come up with climate and um, safety action teams at each school where the full community comes together and talk about issues deeply, what is happening in their school and make a report and send that to the superintendent. So these are the kinds of things we can work on in our budget. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Mandel. Last week, I was at a doctor's appointment with one of my kids, and there was a police officer there that my kids said, thank you for your service. And I got to talking with him, and he was a school SRO for decades, along with many other uh, SROs in his, uh, in his district. And he was telling me the number one mistake that Montgomery County Public Schools made was removing the SROs out of the schools. And, and I agreed with his assessment. I thought that he was doing incredible work that we discussed you know, the interfacing that he was doing with students, not just about crime. He was only addressing situations when the school called him, but he was proactively making connections with students about best practices for their lives. Thank and I you, think that that's Mandel. really important. Thank you. Moving on to our large candidates, Ms. Kim. Um, I think school resource officers could be another human in the students' lives where deep relationships could make impact. I've certainly seen students make relationships with SROs as well as custodians, staff members. It's not just teachers that made that difference. I do think SROs need deep training on bias, brain-based, um, as well as trauma-based training so that we do not continued the same sort of system that de delineates what is positive or, or not, and instead put more effort and time into training so that we're all, every single adult, is working hard towards our children's support and growth. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Um, I think we need a close partnership with our uh, police partners for times when serious incidents are threatening schools, but I would much prefer that we focus in on things that truly support students and make them feel seen and valued in school, because if they feel seen and valued, they're going to be less likely to do to make the kind of bad decisions that that people seem to want police to come into schools to address. And so our restorative justice work, if it's done with fidelity, it works. And we've got to have a tighter partnership with our, our uh, positive youth development team in HHS. 
Thank you. Ms. Montoya. Thank you. As a former juvenile public defender and a mom, I know that this is a question where we really have to keep balance in mind. Kids need connection and clear boundaries. They also need to know that there are consequences for bad behavior because that's real life. What we're doing right now is not working. Um, I do think that we need more data. It's unclear whether there's some sort of community consensus. I think we need to talk to our principals, administrators, teachers, as well as our families and students. Um, I know from some security teams that in some schools, they feel like it's fine and others perhaps not. Thank you. Mr. Hedayat. Well, we should, we should start with being honest about the SRO program. The SROs, we're seeing the students and we're valuing the students. That's the reality of the program. They built great, wonderful relationships. The parents know this. The teachers know this. The principals know this. The only people is the, that don't notice this is the political class in Montgomery County. They have decided to vilify SROs for political purposes only. And the only way to have a safe community in the schools is to bring back our school resource officers, not the CEOs, but the original SRO program 1.0. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mofor. Yes, first and foremost, we have to reinstall school resource officers back in school. They were nationally recognized by Calia for the overall level of being an extremely formidable uh, police department. Secondly, we have to reform our philosophical approach on discipline. We have to install substantive discipline measures. If not, we will unfortunately uh, embolden kids to practice more in subordination practice. And teachers have voiced and echoed these sentiments. So those are the number one things I'll institute to kind of rekindle school safety in our education system. Thank you. Moving on to our district two candidates, but I will read the question one more time for our audience. The question is on student safety. How should the Board of Education ensure the safety of all students? What is your position on having police in schools? Ms. Diaz. Yes, thank you. So I'm, I've got to say, I'm deeply disappointed in the board when they decided to ignore MCAP's recommendations to keep the SROs in the school buildings. I'm when I was teaching at Gatesburg High School, I saw how the SROs built relationships with students and with teachers and kept our building safe. I want to see the SROs come back. I want the student code of conduct to be revised to implement consequences to keep all of our students safe. We know that our SROs are role models for our children and they're essential to building relationships with everyone in the building. Thank you. Moving to Ms. Ma Ms. Mandrowski. Yes, thank you. Um, well, as was mentioned earlier, um, this is a topic that we just discussed at today's board meeting. I highly recommend everybody watch it. Um, I think I'm a, I've always been a strong believer in and advocate of our SRO program. However, I do believe that we need to ensure that those people are handpicked to be someone who wants to be a role model for our children. They need proper training and we need to start building those relationships with our children in the elementary school and have them stationed at middle schools instead of high schools. Thank you. Mr. Moy. Thank you. As a parent and a problem solver, I see this as a long-term and a short-term problem. The short-term, I've spoken to SROs, Corporal Crow, Sergeant Baccaro, and Rockville Police. They want to be back in the school. They want to be uh, proactive. We don't need, uh, you know, there is a short-term problem, which is kids not going to school, doing drugs, vaping in the in the bathrooms. Can the school administrators take care of these problems by themselves? I think not. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Zimmerman. Um, I first believe that we need more data on the current CEO program before we decide anything about its future or if we... Um, make decisions regarding SROs there. Um, I want to bring the root of this problem back to our short staffing, or particularly in our mental health staff. Um, I believe that students need to feel emotionally safe before um, anything else, and that will help take care of these other issues. I believe that MCPS needs regulations and consequences, but we also need to be preventative in these measures as opposed to just reactive. Thank you. Ms. Choi. Okay, so I'm um, for bringing the SRO into the schools because uh, I think that 
at uh, increasing the, uh, the number in the school and also increasing the number of security guards in the school going to increase the safety of the student. And whenever there is a school lockdown in one of my kids' school, I feel good and safe when I know that the police officers are back in the school to respond to, to, uh, to uh, the incident that had happened. So I think it would increase the safety of the school uh, of the student and the school, uh, school board definitely. Thank yes. you so much. We are now going to move to question four. Question four is about parental input. What is your position on parents deciding to opt their children out of classroom instruction and materials that they object to or consider inappropriate? We're going to start off with our at-large candidates, Ms. Montoya. Thank you. Um, I think that people definitely deserve to have a voice. They deserve to be heard. They deserve to give their input. But this is a public school system. And in a public school system, we're inclusive of all of our students because all of our students and families deserve to see themselves in the curricula. So I don't support an opt-out policy. And in fact, neither does the state of Maryland. The Freedom to Read Act was passed during this past legislative session. That's HB 785 and SB 738. And it is on its way to the desk of the governor of Maryland. And it effectively precludes people from being able to ban books in schools. Thank you. Mr. Mofor. I emphatically support an opt-out within our education system. Parents subsidize the education system and we've instituted recordation taxes and new property tax hikes. Parents, it, it's tyrannical to demand that parents fund the education system and not allow them to have an input within the curricula. I'm not against the eradication of the inclusive curricula. It should be in the health and family life curricula, not the English language arts cur curricula. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kim. Yes, I very much support a curriculum that is inclusive, reflective of all the beautiful diversity of our community. And I very much believe that as a school system, we should take this opportunity to educate our community and our parents and have open dialogue about these issues so that we can get to closer understanding because our students are a reflection of what our parents believe and not having that dialogue with families certainly I think is a, a misstep for us as, a, as an organization or as a community. Um, I think we need to have strong, thoughtful, consistent policies about how we approach questions of opt-out and you. what it includes and what does not include. Thank and you, Ms. Kim. Ms. Harris? Uh, I think I'm pretty strongly on the record as uh, uh, opposing an opt-out when it comes to inclusive curricula in our classrooms. There is a, a an opt-out available for certain elements of our family life curricula um, that is longstanding, but uh, the purpose of inclusive curricula, again, it's windows and mirrors. We want to make sure every student sees themselves reflected in the content they're taught and the books they read and the people who teach them those things, but we also want them to learn more about others whose experiences are different. That's how we create creative thinking problem solvers. Thank you. Mr. Hadayat. I'm in support of a opt-out program because I believe that parents are inevitably the uh, responsible caregiver of their children. They know best, not bureaucrats who decide what is important for um, parents to believe or not to believe. These are sensitive topics. The school board has decided to take an abrasive approach to people of faith. And I think that the people of faith, and are, if you're really about diversity, equity, and inclusion, that includes people of faith. And, the, and I think the Board of Education should respect that. Thank you. We'll move on to our District 2 candidates. I'll read the question again. This is on parental input. What is your position on parents deciding to opt their children out of classroom instruction and materials that they object to or consider inappropriate? I'd like to call on Ms. Mandrowski. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I think that, you know, fear, um, a lack of education can tend to build fear. And I think that it's important for us as a public school system to ensure that all of our students see themselves reflected in and represented by our curriculum. Um, I think that the state has gone to great consideration in determining what should and should not be available for opting out. And I, I respect that and follow that, but I need us to know that all of our children feel like they are part of our system. Thank you, Ms. Choi.
Um, uh, I support the uh, uh, opt out. Uh, for me, when I bring my kids to the school, I want them to get an education, to learn, to uh, to reflect what they're learning and everything. So I am against uh, the fact that. Uh, the, uh, MTPS is uh, removing the parent right and uh, not allowing them, uh, allowing the, the kids to be taught something that is against the parents' uh, religion or conscience. So I favor Opta. Thank you. Ms. Zimmerman? Um, MCPS's job is to prepare students for their future in all capacities as they mature, and this includes preparing our students to interact with diverse people. Um, I want to echo what Ms. Harris has said in, said in her opening statement, and again now, about murals and windows, that I use the same philosophy when choosing books in my own classroom. Um, families and caregivers, like with any school subject, should be guiding their student in ways that they see fit to develop their academics and morals. It's not the job of MCPS or an educator to parent, but instead prepare students for the world and to be good citizens. Thank you. Ms. Diaz? Yes, I am strongly in favor of the opt-out. I am also strongly in favor of, well, with MCAP's recommendation, the elementary school body, the that committee, when they told MCPS that re uh, removing the opt-out option would actually divide the community uh, even further and that it would put teachers as middlemen between families and their students. We need to restore the opt-out to unify our community again and then to respect the religious freedoms of everyone in Montgomery County. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Mr. Moy. I am not sure where he went, but I will give him a chance to respond if he comes back and um, my uh, my technical assistant team will let me know. I'll move on to District 4, Ms. Stewart. Yes, um, I am strongly for inclusive curricula and against an opt-out policy. We need to be truly inclusive and represent our full student body in our curriculum, but we also need to roll out initiatives in a clear and consistent way throughout our county. Part of the problem was um, this was not done when new books were admitted and different principals handled opt out differently. So we need to make sure we're consistent and we're communicating that with our public as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Evans. Sure, so I, I answered very really short in your guide. I do not support opting out of curricula. And I do um, think it's very important for our students to see a reflection of themselves in the curriculum. But I also think it's important when we are um, on the issue of sensitive topics that we are courageous and have the conversations with our parents to find out where our interests align and then to d disagree in a better way. So um, again, I do not support opting out of curricula. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Ms. Mendel. I wrote a 2000 word piece about this opt out issue for the free press. And I'm honestly, I'm astounded to hear Mrs. Evans say that we need to have an open, honest dialogue with parents that's respectful because the Board of Education didn't. They locked parents out and they locked journalists like myself out. And that's why partially I'm suing MCPS because they locked those meetings in violation of open meetings acts. The way that many of these educators many of these Board of Education candidates are speaking, we have to educate parents. No, that is disrespectful. People hold opinions that are, are based in their faith, and it's not because they're idiots, it's not because they are bigoted, it's because they hold different beliefs, and we need to be inclusive of everyone's beliefs, Thank including you. religious parents. Thank you, Ms. Mandel. I'd like to give a moment to see if Mr. Moy can, Moy can come back. See him. I think he lost connection and he's trying to rejoin. Okay. All right. Um, since we are at the eight o'clock mark, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go ahead, um, start with one more question and then we will do um, the closing statements. So question number five is on discrimination and the misconduct in schools. 
what specific solutions do you propose to solve bullying, hate bias incidents, and misconducts in schools? The first group will be District 4, Ms. Mandel. It's time to do away with restorative justice. We've tried it the way of this board uh, and it's, it hasn't worked and it's not working. We need to make sure that students understand that there are consequences for bad behavior and bring back the SROs. We need students to understand that school is not a place where anything but learning happens. Math and reading, at the end of the day, we need to emphasize merit and take control of the schools again. And that that is a lot of why teachers are also having a lot of issues, not just teaching, but with morale as well. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Sure. I believe every child needs to feel safe in school, every child. And so uh, this includes um, stopping bullying or re changing the climate in the school so they're not constantly being bullied either for their religion, um, their gender identity, if they're LGBTQ, um, and race. So we need to attack this by really focusing on what the culture of the school is and working to change that and working on training with restorative justice. Training, it needs to be implemented more um, evenly and through Thank the you. system. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Evans. Sure. Relationships matter. I think it's really important that our educators, our teachers, staff, everyone in the building have the time to build the relationships with our students because that can make a difference. Restorative coaches are making a difference and it's just one measure. We want to ensure that our students feel safe. They feel um, included in their school. And we also want to engage our parents in this conversation. Parents are your children's first teachers. And I think that having a conversation being able to talk with parents and with the school community can make a difference. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to our at-large candidates, but I will also read the question. Um, it's on discrimination and misconduct in schools. What specific solutions do you propose to solve bullying, hate bias incidents, and misconduct in schools? We'll start with Ms. Montoya. Thank you. Um, we need clear and consistent connection and consequences. It's not one or the other. Kids need the connection so that we can get to the root of things like bullying. They also need the connection so that the victims of bullying and of these hate incidents are given the proper support and services and that they're not just blown off and their families don't feel like no one cares. And um, we also need to front load some anti-hate education for students, for staff, um, such as that that will likely be required through the passing of HB 1386, which is on its way to the governor's desk requiring anti-bias training for school employees. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Becoming an anti-bias system is priority one, and it requires multiple measures. But one of the most important is to do strong anti-bias and upstander training that is co-created with the students and members of the community that suffer from anti-Semitism, from homophobia, from anti-Muslim hate bias, so that the trainings are actually relevant. But we also have to acknowledge that in a system of 160,000 students and 25,000 staff, we are going to, in that diversity, have every form of bias that exists. Thank you. Ms. Kim. I agree with my other candidates. Um, we need to make sure that we put a priority emphasis on training for every single adult in the building, not just the educators. Um, I think we also need to involve our school leaders and community members and, help, and listening to them and hear from them what they believe needs to be uh, put in place unique to their school community, along with the countywide uh, training um, focus areas. And we just really do need to understand that this is a reflection of our larger society. And we as Montgomery County can take active steps to learn Thank and train and start the dialogue Thank so you, that we Ms. get Kim. to better understanding of one another. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Mr. Hadaya. Well, M Milton Freeman once said, you don't judge a policy by its intentions because all policies are done with good intentions. You judge it by its results. And if you listen to actual parents that have had that had children be victimized in school, 
they'll tell you that restorative justice uh, is not working. And I'm just telling you based on conversations I've had with all the people who filled out COSAs and, um, uh, and because of this, it's watered down justice is what it is. There needs to be more stricter policies, uh, more zero tolerance for certain things. We have too many guns coming into our schools, too many drugs coming into our schools. The kids know they can get away with it. And Thank you. Happen. Thank you, Mr. Hadaya. Mr. Mopor. Yes, bullying and harassment, more specifically anti-Semitism, is a real problem in MCPS. Under my leadership, that ends. We actually have to reform our philosophy on discipline. Any student that's caught engaging in anti-Semitism will trigger an automatic level five expulsion long-term from MCPS. Those are the, some of the solutions that I see. And more than anything, unfortunately, restorative justice is an injustice to victims. We have to change that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Choi, moving on to District 2 candidates. Ms. Choi. Uh, so, hate is uh, never the solution. Hating a person, hating a race, hating a religion, hating, hating anything is not... Uh, it is never good. It is never gonna end up in a, a, a good place. So I would want want to have a more dialogue between bystander. I would like the teacher and the counselor to talk to about to talk to the kids that are bullying bullies and also to the uh, people that are bullying other people. So we we have we emphasize on the uh, punishment. We emphasize on talking to the kids and telling Thank them you. that what they're doing is wrong. Thank you. Mr. Moy. Thank you. I also would like to weigh in on the parent, uh, be on the record for the parent uh, input, but I'll get to that later. For this topic, bullying, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia, anti-Asian uh, hate, these exist because we allow it to exist. As a policy, we don't allow it to exist. We take uh, direct action, we remove the students, we do not allow this to perpetuate. If this is a if it's driven from the home front, we need to work with the parents. Day in the life of the of uh, you. the person you're going to be who you're bullying. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Mandrowski. Yes, thank you. First and foremost, we need anti bias training um, at all all levels, starting from the top up and going down. Um, we need to be continually. Um, reevaluating our policies and making sure that they are um, inclusive of the problems that we're seeing in our schools. Um, we need to listen to the concerns of our students, our staff, and our parents, and do everything we can to take action. Um, but most importantly, I also think we need to educate our students on the fact that there are consequences to our actions. Thank you. Ms. Diaz? First and foremost, I believe that we need to start supporting our teachers, administrators, and parents when it's time to implement consequences. Bullying, threatening, and harassment take place primarily because we allow those things to take place. This is the policy, the restorative justice policy is one which the Board of Education and MCPS fully supports, and we need to look at it critically. We need to revise our student code of conduct so that students understand that when they engage in any hate, bias, any anti-Semitism, any direct action towards students, that there will be serious consequences. Thank Connections you. happen when teachers are teaching and students can learn. We Thank need to you, bring Ms. back Diaz. true discipline. Thank you, Ms. Diaz. Ms. Zimmerman. Um, I wanna echo, echo what some of my fellow candidates have brought up about bias training. I have to say that current MCPS practice is to utilize kind of a click-through approach to professional development in this regard. Um, and that is not how we would educate our students. That's not how I educate my second graders. Um, so I don't think that that's how we should be educating our educators as well. Um, I do believe that restorative justice is not being implemented with fidelity across MCPS. Some schools have a full-time restorative justice coach, some part-time, others just have a stipend position for our already overworked teachers. Um, this is another thing that Thank can't- Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. So now we have reached the end of our Q&A portion of the forum. I hope all the candidates can give themselves a pat on the, on the back. It was 30 seconds is not easy to answer these questions. So thank you so much. Um, we are now going to move on to our um, closing statements. Each of our statements uh, will be given within one minute. And um, given that Ms. Mendel had entered late and did not have an opportunity to um, 
give her opening statement. We will add 30 seconds to her clock and she will have one minute and 30 seconds. I know that Mr. Mui also had brought to my attention, he would like to answer the question that he had missed earlier. So Mr. Mui, Moi, I'd like to start with you. Well, thank you. Parental input, I stand with the parents. As a parent, this rationally makes sense. Opt out is a symptom of a larger problem. Religious, uh, if it offends your religion, your culture, your customs, people are using the opt out as the last resource, recourse. What we need to do is solve the problem, not the symptom. I've recently had a chance to read some of this offensive material. And if I, if an adult or a child did these same acts that they're allowed to read, they would likely be put in jail. So thank you, thank you very Moy. much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Now we will move on to closing statements. I will start off with District 4. You all have one minute. Ms. Mendel. Oh, Ms. Mendel actually has one minute and 30 seconds. She just happened to be the first on my list. <laughs> Thank you. That was, that was my secret ploy all along to get 30 <laughs> seconds. Thank you very much. Um, so I will also introduce myself because I didn't really have much of an opportunity. My name is Bethany Mandel, a mom of six. Uh, my kids are running around right now with scissors threatening to give the dog a haircut. Um, and this is, you know, this is exactly why I'm running for Board of Education to get away from my children. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's because kids matter a great deal. I homeschool my children and a lot of folks have asked me, well, why are you running for school board if you homeschool your children? And the answer is in part, there's no one on the school board who currently represents the views of parents who are homeschooling or also sending to private school. Um, but also because what happens in our school system matters a great deal for our entire community. Um, the, the kids who are going to public schools are the kids that my kids are going to date, they're going to be friends with. All of this matters and we need community buy-in. Right now, I'm not seeing that from the Board of Education. I'm not seeing a buy-in. I'm a journalist and I was locked out of Board of Education meetings earlier this year during the opt-out. And what's very frustrating about what's happening during the Board of Education meetings is that there is this hyper-focus on, uh, issues that are not relevant to students' day-to-day -day success. We need kids to be in school, to be safe, and to be receiving an education that is adequate. Right now, if you look at the school, if you look at the school test scores, that's not what kids are getting right now. My kids are privileged. I remember we used to use that word, check your privilege. My kids are privileged to have the ability to have a Thank mom you, who is Ms. able Mandel. to teach them. But Kids across Montgomery County should Thank have the you. ability to read on grade level, and that's not what they have right now. Thank you, Ms. Mendel. Um, Ms. Stewart. Thank you so much for having this us here today. Um, I actually love our school system. My kids both graduated from MCPS. They had great teachers. But the last couple of years, we've hit a crisis. Um, over 60 MCPS administrators have left over a two-year period, and there have been multiple lawsuits. We are still woefully behind in reading proficiency and in math scores. Our kids are doing amazing things every day, but schools need to mo do more to support them. And we need better pay and training for staff, smaller class sizes, access to mental health services, and steps to improve safety. The board can't make these improvements on their own. We need to collaborate with other entities and that's what I've done for years. So please visit laurastewart.org and act with me to bring accountability, collaboration and transparency to the Board of Education. And I'll see you at the polls. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Yes, so we are so fortunate to live in a county where education is paramount. I have had the extreme pleasure to serve on the board at the local level, and I am the treasurer at the state level for the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, where I also chair the Educational Equity Committee. And we have recently um, created a workbook on leading for school board governance with 13 of my other colleagues across the state. I say all this to say that I have the experience and at this critical time, we need candidates that have the experience and have the, the will to do the work. My colleagues have been very gracious in um, having their faith in me to serve as the president two consecutive years and as the vice president twice. We want to continue to make everything happen and around expanding pre-K, um, making certain educational equities at the forefront um, of our decisions. 
vote for me on May, on, on May the 14th and go to votesheverevans.com. I thank again the League Women Voters and the, and the other sponsors for hosting this event this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to our District 2 candidates, Ms. Zimmerman. Thank you. Um, I think my biggest strength coming into this is my experience as an elementary educator. I've spent my entire educational career teaching in Title I community schools. And every year I see approximately 25 to 30 percent of my colleagues leave the school or leave education as a whole. And these aren't just theoretical numbers for me. This is my actual experience. These are things that I live every day as an educator. Um, I also come with a great strength of my connection to the classroom and my relationships with fellow educators and with students. We need people on the Board of Education who have actually been in the classroom and have been there recently and that they know what's happening. Someone that has these connections with their with students and with educators. And I believe that I can be that champion for our students and for our classrooms in Montgomery County Public Schools. I hope that you join me at Zimmerman for BOE.com. And again, thank you for hosting and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Ms. Choi. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for organizing this forum. And I'm, I'm very glad that you had invited me. So like I told, said in my uh, opening statement, I have five children and all of them have attended uh, Montgomery uh, County Public School. The two first are graduated. The third is about to graduate. And uh, the, the young, two youngest were in the school system until me and their f f father, we find out that we are not in agreement with the school system anymore. I know we can change the system to make it a better system for all students, for all Montgomery County students. And I, I believe in that. That's why I'm learning and I know that I can make a change if given the chance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Montgomery County voters, I am proud to live here. The aspect I admire the most is that the residents here care. We care about the quality of life. We want our neighborhoods to be safe. Above all, many of us paid a premium to live in Montgomery County based on the anticipation of, a, of an excellent school system. The expectation was that the school board policies be consistent and that our kids would receive the very best education regardless of where you lived in the county. I am fortunate to have met so many MCPS employees and students who have taken a chance to confide in me their needs. I stand with them and for them. I stand with the parents and guardians, and I thank the wonderful teachers who care for our students. I've been a Cub Scout Den, den leader, I'm on the PTA. I'm on multiple nonprofits. I support you. our students. Please vote for Ricky F. Moy. Thank you, Mr. Thank Moy. You. Ms. Diaz. Thank you so much for having me this evening. I, I really want to talk about uh, as we end this evening on just how much I love teaching, uh, how much I love my students and how much I love being in the classroom. I've been in education for 20 something years now and my priority has always been to make sure that my students not only learn the content, but love the content. And so that means delivering content, either Spanish or social studies, AP, ESOL, doesn't matter. Making sure that they get the best of me as a professional. And that's what I want to bring to the board. I will bring the best of me as an educator, having been in education for 20 years, taking on various roles, even as a union building rep, I know the inside scoop and I know how to ask the necessary questions. I have that keen insight to deliver. And so I am just super excited about serving on the board and bringing all of my skills, all of my talents, all of my love for teaching and all of my love for learning. Thank Brenda you. Brenda and Diaz, Diaz for BOE.com. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mendrosky. Yeah, thank you. I think it's almost impossible to get to know somebody really in these quick little uh, blips of uh, conversation. But um, 
Since elected, I passionately worked as a member of the Montgomery County Board of Education to relentlessly represent my constituents with an independent and forward-thinking voice. Uh, my years of experience on the board allow me to provide historical insight and the leadership needed for new members to uh, better understand the challenging situations that we come across and that we currently have. Um, I have a deep, deep commitment to the success of our school system, comp uh, compassion for our students and staff, and the years of experience in knowing, seeing what we've gotten right, but also what we've gotten wrong. Um, I know what happens when people don't collaborate and decisions end up getting make it, made not in the best interest of our students in our classrooms. Um, I hope you will continue to support me. Thank you. Moving on to our large candidates, we'll start with Mr. Moore Access to a strong education ultimately gives people the prerequisite skills needed to be competitive in the labor market and promulgates economic enfranchisements. The central office of our education system has been captured by a cabal of administrators who prioritize the consolidation of power and political expediency. In theory, restorative practices and deviating from conventional mechanisms of discipline are ideal. But from a practical standpoint, it emboldens insubordination and jeopardizes school safety. It's time for new blood that will usher in innovative ideas to remedy the current status quo in our education system and restore MCPS's status as a standard bearer for a thriving education system. We must take decisive action to bring about the necessary changes. This requires implementing wage parity for paraeducators, providing extended learning opportunities, expanding CTE, establishing an oversight committee, and reforming our philosophy on discipline. Thank you guys so much, and please follow me on Twitter at Fitzgerald Mofor. Thank you. Ms. Montoya. MCPS currently faces enormous challenges from expanding universal pre-K pre to maintaining inclusive curricula, closing achievement gaps, securing building repairs, making sure that we have enough resources and staff, as well as ensuring that our schools are safe and hate-free. As a mom and a lawyer, I'll bring my personal and professional skills to address these challenges. My children are eight and nine. I live MCPS every single day, and I'll continue to for at least the next 10 years. I'm Rita Montoya, and I'll fight for our students and the education that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hadaya? So uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, and thank you for all the people who are listening to this to he hear what the candidates had to say tonight. Look, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and again and expecting a different result. That's what the current Board of Education has brought us. Those are the results. You're seeing that graduation rates are lower. We're seeing more gun, guns brought to school, more drugs brought to school. This is a direct reflection of the current board and we need new leadership. Let's bring back our SROs. Let's bring back accountability. Let's bring back uh, fiscal responsibility to MCPS. Through those measures, we're gonna have a better MCS, but we gotta start with new candidates because the old is not producing the results that we need in Montgomery County. Thank Thanks. you. Ms. Kim? We moved to Montgomery County almost 20 years ago because we were told then that this is the best school system in our region. Except for the great teachers we have had, our experience has been mediocre and inconsistent. Ooh. Our children, spend the majority of their waking hours at school and I'm motivated to strengthen their school experience now, not three years from now. All of our children deserve to attend schools where they get pushed and supported based on who they are and their individual needs. They need to know that people are rooting for them, that they are at a place where they, they are known and that they matter because of the relationship they have with peers and adults. I will bring my 25 years of education and system leadership experience and expertise to help our children have a much improved experience at school. I will absolutely focus on nurturing the social, emotional, and academic development of them, as well as make sure that MCPS becomes a district of choice for educators and hold uh, support and hold accountable the superintendent to those priorities. I believe this is possible, and I, this is why I'm asking for your vote during the primaries. Melissa for Montgomery.com. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Ms. Harris. Thank you again for hosting this uh, candidate forum. I really do believe it's such a public service 
to provide an opportunity for people to do their homework before they go to the polls. And I can say do their homework because I was a, an MCPS CTE teacher. And that's one of the lenses through which I view the work I do on the board. I'm also a parent. My son graduated from Einstein in 2021. I bring my, my experience as a lawyer and as a nurse and as a public health professional to the work and look at every single piece of the way we we operate as a system through all of those lenses. I'm also a very pragmatic problem solver and I see opportunity everywhere. I'm not a deficit thinker. I look at the resilience all of our students have and want to focus very much on giving them the tools they need to build a future and the foundation for that future in the halls and walls of our schools. We need to fix what's broken. We need to celebrate what's working and go to a school. I'm in schools all the time. You walk in anyone, there's great stuff happening and we need structures of accountability. Thank you, Ms. Harris. So we have reached the end of our forum. We thank you all for joining tonight. Thank you, especially to our candidates who have joined us and made time out of their busy schedules to share their vision for Montgomery County Public Schools. We do have a recording of this forum available. We'll make it available on the, U the Montgomery County League of Women Voters YouTube channel. And we can't emphasize this enough. Please don't forget to vote. You can vote by mail. You can vote early between May 2nd and May 9th. And the primary election day is on May 14th. Everyone be safe and please have a great evening. Good night. Night.